this um, research started out in 1999, and uh, and I was shopping around the the Earth and Biological Sciences Department, uh, just down in the basement here in the other building too, for a research project. And I didn't like any of the projects the teachers were uh, suggesting me. And one teacher told me, well, last year I visited Peru and I found a and we found an area with um, many fossil whales. And I said, that's it. Going there. <laughs> and uh, the, teacher, the teacher didn't want to start it because he couldn't speak Spanish. So ah, that's not a problem for me. Uh, so we, that's how <laughs> his name is Dr. Leonard Brand. I think most of you know him. So he, he got me initiated in this, and I'm happy. Um, and I've been doing that with him and other, and other people, you'll see the pictures, for over 10 years now, 12 years. Okay, what's the problem? The, pro the main problem that any creationist model for the history of life faces is the interpretation of radiometric dates. And I didn't come here to bring the solution. Okay, that's a disclaimer. And I don't have the solution. I don't have it. But I, I think we can put on the table elements that may question their validity and their, their underlying uh, assumptions. Not only are radiometric dates too long in the light of the biblical chronology, but also they seem consistent throughout the geological column. There's basically two problems in this. The, rate, the radiometric dates and rates of the position. Let me explain the second, because it's less known. Uh, geologists and scientists measure the, r the rate at which the uh, sediments accumulate on the seafloor or on the bottom of lakes or on exposed land. In modern times, rates of deposition are very slow, although some geologists have estimated that they are both rates of erosion and sedimentation are too fast and that the earth would have been um, eroded many times over throughout the, you know, billions of years. And I think Dr. Rod uh, wrote a few papers about that. But the still, rates of sedimentation are very slow in modern times to account for the formation of fossils. Geologists and paleontologists use a uniformitarian approach. Let's translate that. It means they apply principles uh, and, and, and rates and processes in the present to the past. So if in, off California sediment off the coast of California, sediment accumulates at a rate about 15 centimeters thick. Sorry, I can't <laughs> think in feet or inches, those weird measurements. I think in <laughs> centimeters and meters throughout my presentation. Okay? So about this thickness accumulates off coast of California in present times over a thousand years. Keep that in mind. So Geologists and paleontologists apply that rate to the past. And they say, well, more or less, between two, three, five centimeters and a few meters accumulated in the past. That's the uniformitarian approach to uh, geology and, and sedimentary, um, sedimentary studies. So any fossil that is this thick would take hundreds or thousands of years to be covered. This is the underlying uh, assumption that we take in this presentation and is based on actualistic studies in modern times. These dates and rates obtained are then used to estimate the rates at which ancient sediments accumulated in the past. Are th the question is, are those low rates of deposition both in modern times and in past times, really as generalized as currently assumed by the standard geology, or were those rates faster in the past? Let's, let's go on a trip 
And uh, when, I, when I got to this, this area in southern Peru, you know, you, you arrive there and lots of questions come up. Um, and you'll see a few of them. This is uh, the desert of uh, southern Peru. It's along the coast. Uh, it's uh, the desert, the coast called the coastal desert that runs from southern Chile or, or central Chile up all the way up to Ecuador. It's several thousand kilometers long and about 30 to 100 kilometers wide. And the Atacama Desert is, is right there. And this is the northern uh, area of the Atacama Desert. It's completely dry, never, never, absolutely never rains. Never rain. If it, if it would, it would be a disaster. Um, so you see here multiple layers. R keep that in mind. It's, it's a very important piece of information. Multiple layers. Um, according to radiometric dating, the Pisco formation, the Pisco, uh, geologists name um, stacks of sediments with names. We call it Pisco because there is a town there with that name. Pisco Formation. And they think that that stack of sediment, about 600 meters thick, took about 12 million years to, the, to be deposited. How do we come up with that um, time? Because, because we, we, date, we dated a layer down here and, or, and another one up here, and there's this much thickness, and the layer down here is about um, 15 million years, and the, and the layer up here is about three point some. So it's about 12 million years in between. We have done the dating ourselves. So we have those dates. And what we date is not bones. Bones cannot be dated. We dated and volcanic ash. Only most, most datable um, material is, consists of volcanic material, igneous, volcanic, or tuff, uh, which is volcanic ash. There is plenty of volcanic ash in these sediments, and uh, we've dated that. That means that every meter of sediment took about 20,000 years to, for the position. A meter is about this thickness, more or less about this, this height. That, according to radiometric dates, there it took 20,000 years to deposit. Keep that figure in mind. It's very important toward the end of the presentation. Now, what we found there, we, we, we started looking for fossils. And this is a hill. Let me show you again. You see that hill and this hill here? Okay, from where I'm taking the picture, that's this hill here. And the one you were seeing before, it was right here. So, this is the valley, there's a river there, and this is the desert, and the ocean is all on the other side. From the valley to top of this hill, there's about 200 meters elevation. And there's, as you can see, there's multiple layers. Some of them stick out and they're very prominent. And, but most of them you don't see in this picture. But there's hundreds of layers here. Some of them are, are, are very relevant and we name them with a, a letter uh, and a number. 24, 22, 20, 17, and so on. Question. Uh, what is cerro in Spanish? Cerro, oh, is hill. So like Cerro Loma Linda is Loma Linda Hill. So is that uh, the hill of whales at the bottom there? Yes, exactly. There are so many whales that the locals call him Whale Hill. Hmm? Or Loma. A Loma is a hill in Spanish. Okay, so these are fossil whales that we found on this hill. And see the, the scale here. This is one kilometer and another kilometer here. So this is about two or three square kilometers. We found over 300 fossil whales just on surface without scratching any sediment. Just walking on surface. 
And there's many more over here and all around and everywhere. Okay, let's go. And they occur in multiple layers. Remember that. Multiple layers, because these hills consist of multiple layers. Okay, there, this is the diagram showing the thickness of the entire formation, basically. 600 meters. That hill that you were seeing is about this thickness. Actually, it's, it's here. It's up here. It's, this, it's on the top. There's more sediment underneath that, that hill, which would correspond to this thickness here. But that hill is over here. And you see it's plenty of fossil whales in multiple layers. Here's one of them. This is actually the very first, uh, the very first one we excavated the first year we worked there. And, um, and you see there, let me explain. This is the skull, the nasal bone, which is very prolonged in whales. These are the two lower mandibles or, or dentaries, the lower mandibles. And this is the neck, the vertebral column, the ribs, and two limbs, one here and the other one here. It's basically 95% complete. Only a few bones of the, tails are, of the tail are missing. Um, and and uh, the bones are pristine, very well preserved, no evidence of scavenging, erosion, any kind of deterioration, nothing. Uh, very well preserved. And uh, in 2003, we submitted a paper to this journal, Geology, on rates of sedimentation. And you can access it online. Um, because we were questioning the rates of sedimentation based on the fossils that we found. And, uh, and that's the topic of this, paper, of this presentation. And the editor liked the, 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 the paper and the, the picture so much that they asked us uh, for a picture for the cover. Um, so skeletons show no evidence of long-time residence on the seafloor after death. That is relevant. And you'll see why later. Be that contracts with what we find in fossil wh in modern whales now. Whales in present time die, they go to the seafloor, they sink, and they deteriorate very fast, and nothing remains after a few years. So the question is, why do we have fossils in the first place? So they are well articulated. The, the bones are perfectly preserved. Most of them are fully articulated, and there's lack of marks by scavengers or erosion. So, questions arose in our minds. What do we do with this? We put ourselves to work. We had have, we have in, in, in our... Uh, the main question is, how do we explain radiometric dates here? Most... Um, well, basically all previous researchers were just, you know, assuming radiometric dates, assuming them as valid and just studying the fossils to classify them. And nobody cared about the, 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 the other questions like, why are there fossils here? And why are they so well preserved? So our approach was, well, let's study the fossils and see what they tell us about our time and about the sediments, and about their history. You know, our work is like of a detective. Hmm? Uh, we find a cadaver, and we ask questions. Why, when, wh how, who, and what? You know, and it's like the CSI detective, uh, but ours is true. <laughs> and theirs is not, because some, and you know very well, some of their analysis, they do it in five minutes, when we know it takes months. I, I can't watch those movies anymore. It's just <laughs> bothering me too much. Yeah, it's they, in an afternoon they solve everything. Well, we know it takes months. Um, so let me show you a few people who work with us. We have faculty from Loma Linda. We have faculty from other Adventist universities, in both from the United States and from overseas. We have non-Adventist scholars coming from various places. 
Um, we have students from many countries. We are actually uh, we are the, uh, we are we are developing a mentoring program, and some of the students that are actually here in this room right now are the result of this mentoring program that uh, we we pay their expenses to go and and uh, and spend a few weeks working with us and helping us and they. They, they realize that there's important questions for Adventists to answer and they, they want to pursue a, a, you know, a PhD in biology, geology, paleontology and this last year we, uh, well these, uh, these are students. Here we have a few students from Argentina, from Colombia, from Peru and, um, and these are uh, Le uh, Dr. Leonard Brand and some from Dr. Biaggi from Argentina this uh, girl is from Spain. This is a wonderful girl from uh, uh, Brazil who wants to study archaeology. And I brought her to, to Peru to get, you know, because paleontology and geology is somehow our sister um, fields. And here, we, this was uh, in January, just a few weeks ago. Um, I'm working on an excavation here, you see. Um, most of the time I spend uh, uh, taking notes, taking notes and photographs, notes, hundreds of pages, and also helping them out. Um, here is the crew this year, last January. You see there's, um, uh, this is uh, myself and my, um, another geologist from the Adventist University in Peru, and this is a colleague from Spain, and all the others are students, who in a few years might be sitting next to you. Okay. Uh, we camped out because sometimes because um, there's no Motel 6 around <laughs> and no Starbucks and nothing like that. Let me show you some of our findings. This is a dolphin, a dolphin that we find so, so well preserved that even the outline of the skin is preserved. That's extremely rare. Even the outline of the skin, of the skin, the ribs. Okay, I guess many of you are related to the medical field, so somehow you know the <laughs> what I'm talking about. This is the 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 mouth. You see the teeth in place. The finishing is not very good, but sorry. Okay, some of other specimens. This is David. Um, and you see the skull here, the, the, the neck, the vertebral column, which is partially disarticulated, the ribs, limbs, the scapula here, the other scapula here, and uh, we find a few shark teeth around. Even though it's partially disarticulated, the bones are perfectly preserved, perfectly preserved. No marks of scavenging or deterioration or, a, or nothing, just perfectly preserved. Another, oh, this is, this is Carmen. Uh, we only exposed it partially because there was a lot of sediment covering it. But see how well preserved it is. This was the only part exposed when we found it. It was sticking out of the slope and that is badly deteriorated because weathering. But the rest of the skeleton is perfectly preserved. Even the neck is connected to the skull. Uh, we found a few shark tooth, shark teeth, but no shark tooth marks at all on the bone. So that's subject for further research. This is IC1. This is the uh, one of the longest whales. To give you an idea, it's about the, w the width of this uh, of this uh, room. Hmm? It's very long, very long for for coming from the past. Uh, blue whales are three times that uh, size, but uh, in back in, in the Pliocene, they, these were the longest whales. And we only exposed them par partially, you know, just halfway through the sediment, because uh, we don't have any place to take them to, you know. It's, it's not something that you put in your pocket. <laughs> so you need um, trucks and uh, this is perfectly preserved, um, completely articulated, everything is preserved, even baleen, baleen, which is the filtering organ 
and I'll come back to that in a few slides, the filtering organ is preserved here. You don't see it, but I see it because I have faith. Okay? <laughs> it's, it's preserved here. This is another specimen. This is Helen. Um, and uh, anyway, more. Um, another specimen, the skull, the two limbs, and the vertebral column. And this one, this one is very remarkable. Okay, how many of you are in the medical fields? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test you. This one has a, a, a this, is, um, this is the skull, and this is one lower mandible, and the other one is next to it. This lower mandible you, was supposed to be here, but somehow was displaced, got displaced, and, and, and lies there. Um, and the neck is here, this is the scapula, the other scapula, the vertebral column, and the ribs, the ribs over one side. And this is a perspective from, from here. You see the, the, the two dentaries here. Now, what do you see there? A fracture. Good. Well, it didn't take me long to realize it was a fracture, but uh, I got the help of a uh, uh, Dr. Ronnie Gasal, um, an orthopedic surgeon here working at the, at the Arrowhead Orthopedics, and he gladly <laughs> diagnosed it for me. <laughs> and uh, it is a fracture, and it's a healed fracture. It was uh, fractured during lifetime, and it healed. And so this is very remarkable, and is the subject of one paper, actually. Um, uh, one paper that we're going to publish. So here is a team, uh, uh, various uh, geologists and, and paleontologists from different countries, and this is this, the um, um, the skull of a whale, a Balanoptera whale, like a a, a, a um, humpback whale or a blue whale. And this is the vertebral column. It's kind of uh, twisted. And this is how we find them sometimes. Sometimes they are partially exposed and sometimes they're completely covered we, and you see, you, you, you see the outline of the sediment and there must be a skeleton down here. And, uh, but mo many times you find them like that. Hmm? Something you would like to find in your backyard. And this is a modern blue whale skeleton. And this is Jonah. Okay, so, um, okay, what we found um, was a remarkable thing that we found was that many of these fossil whales have baleen preserved. Now, for you who are in the medical and biology fields, you'll find this very interesting for two reasons. One, baleen which is the filtering organ, you see there, they open the mouth, they swallow a lot of water, and they, they spell it out. Okay? They spell it out and retain uh, small fish and krill and anything that uh, was in the water. That organ is, it consists of plates, of, or flat plates of keratin. Keratin is, is your, your finger nails and your hair. That's the composition. So it's, 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 it's labile and, and it tends to deteriorate faster than bone. But there's another thing that, is, uh, in, that makes this finding very remarkable. Baleen is attached to the, the upper gum with an organic glue. It's not rooted into the maxillary like our teeth are, and forgive me for my um, wrong descriptions, okay? I'm not a dentist. Um, so there's no roots going into the bone. There's just an organic um, component, an organic glue, uh, keeping baleen attached to the gum. Once the animal dies, that organic glue decays. And baleen, the, 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 that apparatus, 
that organ detaches and drifts away and decays. How do we know that? Observations for mod from modern times. This is a, a gray whale found a few years ago in Santa Barbara, on a, on, on a, on a beach in near Santa Barbara in California. And you see baleen there. Two days later, no baleen. Um, and the whale also was uh, uh, flipped over. No baleen, only the tongue, the tongue. No baleen and the skin is gone as well, only a few pieces of skin. So, we found a lot of fossil whales with um, baleen preserved. And not only preserved, but in live position, in anatomical position. Here, this is stripes are baleen. And this is the skull, and, and this is the zygomatic arc, then the neck. Are they mineralized? Mineralized. Mm -hmm. I'll show you details later. When I, when I found the, these first the specimens, I, you know, I began to be curious about this. So I searched literature and museums. I visited tens of museums in many countries looking for fossilized baleen. And I found seven specimens. Five of them, actually four of them, in California. A fifth, I discovered myself in a museum in California. They didn't know they have it. And uh, another one in Switzerland, which actually came from Peru. And another one in Oregon. That's it. Seven specimens with fossilized baleen. We have now a record of 60 specimens in Peru. We published a paper a few years ago in just on this, on this uh, occurrence, uh, fossilized baleen, reporting 37 or some. And since then, we, we found many more. And here you have um, another. Um, this is the, the lower mandible and the nasal bone. And the maxillary bone would be here is mostly destroyed by erosion. And this is baleen in live position. How can that be if baleen detaches in a matter of a few hours or a few days after death? After death. Okay, I leave that question for reflection. But think, remember this. It's very important. This thickness. About this thickness, 40 centimeters, remember that. That is the thickness of that skeleton. It's very, very important. And think of the 20,000 years for one meter. Okay? That's so approximately is at 1 20th of a millimeter per year. You do your own calculations. I guess you have uh, cell phones with um, calculators. 8,000 8, years? Okay, 8,000 years. We'll come back to that later. Here are some details of, uh, of uh, baleen. Baleen is fossilized in between these stacks of sediment. It's fossilized there and shrank. Baleen is about 3 to 5 millimeters thick, but when it, it fossilizes, it, it becomes a fraction of uh, a millimeter. This is modern baleen. This is modern baleen sediment here got in between, in between it, and, and fossilized it, petrified. This is another specimen. This is the skull and the, the scapula here and baleen in situ. There is a, a detail. Okay. Paleontologists believe that the present is the key to understand the past. Therefore, we should study what happens to whales in the present to ascertain what happened in the past. And just following the same methodology as any other geologist. And in the field, we work as any other scientist. Actually, we bring uh, non-believers and atheists and non-adventists to work with us. We need their insights. And they actually... Uh, we help them see things that they don't see, and they help them see things, help us see things that we don't see. That's very good for everybody. But we 
use the same methodologies. And I'm going to use the same assumptions now. Let's assume that the past was similar to the present. So, I, I decided to study dead whales in the present. Something that most people would not do. But it's actually fascinating. So I contacted a, a research institution um, asking for help on this. And I found that uh, there's many, in some places, whales tend to go uh, to strand, get stranded. So I, I kind of uh, study what happened to stranded whales. They disarticulate, okay? They, they first, they, they their soft tissue removed and then they disarticulate, disarticulate very fast. And after a few years, no bones are preserved. Some other whales sink to the bottom of the sea. And they are colonized by these creatures that eat the flesh and then start eating uh, the bone. Because whale bones are very rich in fat. Very rich in fat. Uh, some of these, um, in, in the Smithsonian Institution, they, ho they house hundreds of uh, modern whales. And the main problem they have is that the, the floor is stained with fat. After a hundred years, they still have fat. Now, if those bones you leave on the seafloor, they last a few months. Because so much fat is a feast for animals down there. So... I got on board of this, um, this uh, research vessel, Embari, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. And we went off the coast and we, 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 were, we searched for dead uh, whales on the seafloor. And we found this one here. We found many, but we studied that one. Uh, February 2002, 3,000 meters depth, 32 miles. Sorry for the miles should be kilometers. Um, and this is the remote vehicle we sent down uh, on to the seafloor with cameras and lights and everything. And this is the, the control room uh, on the vessel. And this is the whale we found, the skeleton. It's a skeleton of a gray whale, 6 February 2002. And... Um, and um, Remember that date and see that the skeleton is, um, is mo uh, very much deteriorated. And um, the skull is almost gone. See here on this side. Mandibles are gone. And look at the creatures living in the sediment. He. Oh, something happened to this. Okay, let's go back again. Okay, now, this is the skull, the neck, and the vertebral column. And part of the bones are partially destroyed. We estimated that this skeleton had been uh, on the seafloor for about six months. Um, well, I don't know what the problem is, but... Yeah. Okay, there we go. This is in March, a month later, a view from the other side. This is um, about one year after it's um, dead. And, um, and you see most of the skull is deteriorated, is destroyed. August 2003, and there's bacterial colonies and all kinds of creatures living on the bones and eating up the bones. You see this bone? This is a rib. It's 50% destroyed already. And, the, and the, the, the vertebra are mostly destroyed. A vertebra is about this size. Okay? And is reduced to 25% of its volume. Uh, and this is a, a phalange full of, uh, of um, borings. Um, so I don't know what how to do this, but 
Um, so you see that the, the level of deterioration is, is, very, is, is very intense. Sometimes I have to do that, otherwise it wouldn't work. Hmm. Okay, see this um, vertebra is being actively eaten up by those crabs. So, I found out, you know, I realized that we have the opposite scenario uh, um, to the, the fossils. And I thought, of, well, this is an example of how not to become a fossil. And actually, I presented a paper in an international congress with that title. Uh, it was a, a poster. If you come to the research, Geoscience Research Institute, you'll see that poster. How not to become a fossil. After about three years, the skeleton is gone. You see details? This is a rib and it's mostly destroyed. So, the paradox, and now comes the reflection. At current rates of deposition, a 40 centimeter thick whales, whale skeleton would take 500 to 4,000 years to bury, or 8,000. Okay? Well, why there did that disparity of figures? Because it depends on the rate of deposition. In some places, the position is relatively fast and in other places it's relatively slow. So let's say 500 to 8,000 meters. Years. Oh, years, sorry. Hmm? A 40 centimeter thick. Modern observations indicate that long before the skeleton would have been disarticulated and the bones dispersed and destroyed. Bones are destroyed within a few months or a few years to a few years. A 40 centimeter whale skeleton would not wait there 500 years, perfectly preserved to be buried. Do you have borings in those things? In, in fossilized? fossilized? No, no borings, absolutely no, nothing. Uh, uh, the usual counter I get to this is that they were, they died in anoxic conditions. So there was no animals to eat them up. Okay, good question. Well, the counter, <laughs> the, the answer is that these deposits are shallow water. We estimate, based on other evidence, sedimentological and other fossils, that that is a, a water depth of between 30 to 50, 60 centimeters, um, meters. Very shallow as to have anoxic waters for 12 million years, okay? I don't know of any modern setting that would fit into that. But that's a good question because geologists almost always, when they want to explain excellent preservation, they come up with that idea, anoxic waters. How can you, can, how can you have anoxic waters for 12 million years in a water depth of 30 meters? It's, you can't. When there is evidence, for currents also. But where do anoxic waters actually occur? Yeah. Very deep, very, very, very deep. Um, deep Black Sea. And yeah. But, but I mean, aren't they pointing out to and life forms even at greatest depths? Yeah. That's a good point. Those modern skeletons that I show you come from 3,000 meters off California coast on the Monterey Bay Basin and off Los Angeles. Waters are anoxic there. They measure the oxygen level. We have the values. They are basically anoxic. Do you see how many fish and crabs and, yeah, and an anemones kind of were living there? Even in the Black Sea where there's very anoxic acidic waters, there's still a degradation by creatures that live in those conditions. Yeah. So and we have anoxic bacteria that do just fine. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, these uh, this, uh, modern whale skeletons are called um, oases. Biologists call them ocean oases because nothing lives outside because it's mostly anoxic. A few creatures live outside, but around a few meters and on the skeleton is uh, plenty of life there. And biologists uh, struggle to explain how these creatures got there. <laughs> but in fact, they do. So <laughs> this is not close to any of these vents or... No. So, so I'm still, I guess I'm a little surprised that 
there, so this whole idea of catastrophism is a not a generally accepted idea? Uh, punctuated equilibrium or catastrophism? No, no. Well, there are two concepts there. Punctuated equilibrium is a one concept. And cat catastrophism is well um, assumed and well um, received within geology. But they say, yeah, the Earth is very old and many catastrophes happened. But they don't accept just one global catastrophe. I, it seems to me that uh, uh, while catastrophe is well accepted, that when you, what are you going to do when you have so many layers throughout the whole thing preserved? And this kind of destroys that argument. I'm com coming to that point. Um, and also, Beilin will have been completely dispersed or destroyed in a matter of a few days. Conclusion. When we apply modern rates of sedimentation to these deposits, we come up with ages of millions of years. We've dated the sediments, and we've come up with millions of years between those two layers. Now, I said, well, we have a problem. Let's study the fossils and see what they tell us. Okay? Um, radiometric dating suggests a long time. However, the study of these fossils and the sedimentary layers as well suggest a much shorter time framework. The occurrence of well-preserved skeletons and baleen strongly suggest rapid burial in a matter of days to weeks for any given whale. Now, remember that we have multiple layers that, and we have adults and juveniles. That means that a catastrophe happened, killed the whales, and we have to come up with an explanation for the death of the whales, the death of the whales, and an, and a, an explanation, a model or a scenario for the burial of the, of, of, of the whales. So they, they, they died and they were buried, but another community lived and repopulated the area. And, and they died and they were buried and, and so on. So... It's hard to explain within a one-year flood model because you have hundreds of layers that will require at least a few decades or a few hundred years. Now, I don't have the answer for that. Maybe it was the flood, maybe. Maybe it was before the flood or maybe it was a after the flood. You know, I don't have the answer for that. It's, nothing, it's, it's not something that worries me. I'm not particularly worried about fitting this into the global Noah's flood. But, I, but I, my interest is first, explain why are they there, why they are there, and how that happened. The when will come in a later time if God you know, wants me to understand it. Um, let me finish, anyway. Uh, the same rocks and fossils can be studied from different viewpoints using same methodology. Uh, this last January, I had in my team several students and teachers, some believers and others were not believers. And we openly discussed up there, you know, standing before the fossils, these issues. And my colleague was saying, well, look, you have here so many layers, so many fossils. You, this requires time said, yeah, I understand that. I even accept that. But look at these features. How do you explain this fossil, this feature, this feature, this feature, if that took thousands or millions of years? Well, I don't know, he said. I don't know. Well, neither do I. I can't answer your questions, and you can't answer my questions. And we worked for two weeks using same methodology, same, same thing. We, we do the same thing. And the same questions come to our minds. And we try to answer following one model, and the other one tries to answer following the other model. If that's okay, um, eventually at the end, we'll hopefully we'll be able to explain things. Meanwhile, I stick with my faith. The fact that I can't explain things within a biblical framework 100%, maybe I'm able to explain it 20%, 40% or 5%, the fact that I can't explain everything within a biblical time framework doesn't stop me from believing 
the Bible. It just encourages me more to believe it and to do more research. We use the same data available, and we come up sometimes with different explanations. An increasing number of studies suggest that some thick sediments were not deposited over a span of time of millions of years, as radiometric dates and modern rates of deposition seemingly indicate. They must have been deposited in a very short span of time. I don't know how much short. That I don't know. But I, I see that the study of these fossils challenge and question radiometric dates. Something has to be wrong with radiometric dates because the study of fossils, and not only these fossils, many other fossils, fossil occurrences, question the underlying the, the radiometric dates. And I'm finishing with this. Although the bulk of radiometric data seems to indicate the slow geologic processes and long ages, there is sound scientific evidence indicating the opposite. That evidence is relevant enough as to conclude that there is a problem with the underlying assumptions in radiometric dates and rates of deposition. I'm reading this so that you leave the room with you know, those three or four ideas clearly presented. An increasing number of studies suggest that some thick sediments were not deposited over a span of time of millions of years as radiometric dates suggest. They must have been deposited in a very short span of time. The same rocks and fossils, I think I've done this now. When we apply, um, uh, this is the same thing. Oh, you're going back. I'm going back. Yeah. I was hitting the wrong button. This is time problem. Yeah. Some things <laughs> occurred differently <laughs> in the past. <laughs> The difference, some people are willing to accept new outrageous explanations that don't fit in the predominant evolutionary long age paradigm. Some, some people don't, are not willing to accept that. However, they may be using the same data and method. The significance, the studies in geosciences are shedding light on earth processes that question evolution and fit well in young earth models and are catastrophes. Scientists don't need to invoke evolution and long ages to explain the fossil record. And I encourage the students that come with us, yay, you work just as any other scientist, but keep in mind that there might be other ways of interpreting things that some people are not willing to consider, and I dare you to consider those possibilities. Raul? Yeah. Uh, one question first. Uh, any turbidites here? Uh, turbidites? In yeah. this? No, we. we uh, secondly, I, I immediately think about whale psychology, and I don't know any specialists in this area, but. Uh, whale psychology? Yes. When See, you I'm trying to understand my wife. Yeah. Well, understanding whales. Well, I've got the same problem. <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, the, uh, uh, we have these mass shoring of whales over the world, you know, uh, where they all, they all come to a certain place, you know, and they beach and they die there. Uh, you showed a picture of some of it there. Uh, have any clue is that m that might be involved in this uh, situation? Stranded whales. Yes, no, stranded they, whales. They, they, uh, we believe they are not related to that because um, the, the um, I, you know there are many things I didn't show, but the the sediments sed do not correspond to a beach sediment; correspond to a platform. <coughs> Underwater. So that's one element. Yeah. Occasionally, when I've presented this argument, some people say, okay, yeah, the whales were buried rapidly within that layer, but then the vast amount of time occurred between the layers. 
Okay. Right. Good, good point. Right. And so you got, yeah, you can have a, a catastrophe, catastrophe there, but then you got all this time between. Okay. Well, if we had time between one layer and the other one, we would be able to see certain things in the sediment. Now, for example, we would be able to see erosion uh, levels. Hmm? The seafloor is not absolutely flat as this table. It has marks of erosion and marks of creatures walking on it and burrows. Hmm? The seafloor is, is bur burrowed by worms, crabs, and, and mollusks. We don't see any of that there except in some conspicuous layers. A few of them have burrows. Yeah. So what do but you... My big question one, then is... What one do every hundred layers. What do your friends say about the lack of bioturbation and the lack of evidence for time between layers? Obviously, they can't... They have to admit that those layers were formed rapidly and then the whales were in a each one of those layers pretty much. So how do your friends who are atheists or evolutionists uh, explain that to you, or what, what do they, they... They don't have a, an, a, an explanation. They suggest the environment wasn't suitable for creatures to live in the sediment. An so anoxic thing. And I say, well, explain that to me. Why wasn't uh, suitable? Well, we don't know, but some reason. Um, but that applies to both models. Okay. These, it wasn't these are suitable... It applies to both models. These are also tertiary layers, right? These are Cretaceous. Yeah, no, tertiary. Tertiary. Miocene, Pliocene. All right, all right good. they're tertiary. So that could possibly be after the flood as well. It could. It could. There was a question here, and then. With so many whales, and uh, if the radiometric data showing the 12 million years from top to bottom, I mean, do the whales appear to have come from the same? period or any signs of species evolution? Oh, species good point. Very good point. We find basically two, two levels. Up to one level, there's whales that we don't see in modern times. They, call, they are called archaeocetes. And from that level up, there's no transition. Uh, modern whales show up. Modern-like whales. Well, the modern topography doesn't matter. No, no, I know, but let's say you say three meters, 300 meters above, so forth. Oh. 300 meters. We can't, we can't, uh, we haven't been able to figure that out yet because the area is faulted. And uh, we're still working on, on correlation of layers to see where the arcuseeds correspond with the others. So that's a current, uh, actually a teacher here is working on that. Okay, I have two questions. I'll ask the first one, which I have a shorter answer probably. Are the whales oriented more or less the same way, right side up, or are they upside down, turn this way, turn that way? Is there any um, similarity yeah. in the or orientation? Okay, that's a good question. I measured uh, each whale we measure with a compass mm -hmm. and also dorsal side up and ventral side up. And... Um, they are randomly oriented, which w you would not expect on stranded whales. Stranded whales usually are parallel to the shoreline, about 80% of them. Um, but here they are randomly, and we measure that with compass. And second, there is about 60 or 65% whales are ventral side up, and about 40 to 45% dorsal side up. Which is reasonable because as, as they, when they die, some of them float for weeks. And as they float, gases accumulate in their belly and they flip over. And then they sink that way. Now, this we find in, unbelievable, I don't have time, but we find unbelievable things that, like the, the skull dorsal side up, but the rest of the skeleton ventral side up. And we found... Uh, vertebral columns with a Z shape. <laughs> and, uh, wow, unbelievable. Okay, the other quick question was, you would kind of uh, referred to it earlier. At the different levels, like you said, 40 centimeters from the top of this whale to the bottom, or at least, can you actually radiometrically date that distance from the top to the bottom? And is there a difference? <sighs> 
No, no, because uh, what we can date is a volcanic ash. There are layers of volcanic ash throughout the sequence. But a volcanic, a layer of volcanic ash is an episodic right. event. So, you, you know, the, the age between the top and the bottom might be a few days or yeah, a few yeah. hours. So there's no way of knowing that other than no, no. speculation or whatever. Before we go on to the next question, I'll point out that it is now 11.30, and I know some of you have places that you need to go. Uh, for the rest of you who want to stay, why we'll uh, continue questions and comments until uh, Raul gets tired. <laughs> the current Smithsonian Magazine refers you to their website showing that whales were mammals, land mammals, that, washed, that uh, adapted or evolved into whales. Did you find anything in the pelvic region suggesting rare legs? Good question. We find um, <coughs> pelvic bones are, uh, um, are rarely found in fossils. Um, one of them, one of the reasons might be because they are not actually attached to anything. So when the skeleton when the, the soft tissue decays, those bones are, are loose and they, they might be destroyed. So that's one reason. But we did find some uh, pelvic bones and they're modern. Um, they have modern look. We didn't find in these sediments any transitional form that would suggest... Um, evolution from a terrestrial mammal to a, um, to a marine mammal. And uh, here we have the whole record from the Eocene 50 million years ago within the evolutionary framework up to 1.5 million years ago within that framework. We would expect to see transitional forms, nothing. Um, regarding the dating of volcanic ash, uh, are you familiar with the dating of any of the modern uh, known eruptions of volcanic ash and what kind of dates one gets from that? Modern? Yes. Well, I'm not into... I'm Obviously, most people wouldn't go dating it because they say, well, we know when that happened. But uh, I'm curious if, if one was going to test, or I should say calibrate, the, 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 this kind of dating method, then you want to calibrate it against known ages. Mm -hmm. And you need some samples with known ages to be sure that... That's a good question, Danilo, but that's a question for this man right here, and maybe for a different... Uh, topic. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, there is, in fact, an article from way back in about 1950 or 1948, something like that, uh, by Brent Dalrymple on, on modern uh, volcanoes. And uh, uh, they, they got dates that were mostly uh, statistically compatible with zero. And there were a couple of them that dated in the future. Um, the way you do that is by subtracting out argon uh, 40 matching argon 36. Um, and they couldn't believe it, so they dated those about um, uh, six and eight times a piece to be sure. And, and sure enough, they do date in the future. And then there were about one-fifth of the dates dated into the past um, into the range of 1.3 million years ago. Uh, there are other reports of dates, particularly from Hawaii, where some of the lava actually flows into the ocean. And they were able to date some of those at 244 million years ago. Um, so there is some evidence that, uh, that uh, potassium argon doesn't uh, completely reset. So uh, I suppose that if you wanted to look at that, that would raise some questions as to yeah. the finality of those radiocarbon dates. Uh -huh. Radio pardon me, uh, potassium argon dates. Radiometric dates are useful, though, in, in <coughs> practical 
users in the field. We use them to trace, to trace uh, layers and to kind of place us <coughs> within the sequence, up or down. They are useful. <coughs> and I'm, I'm not uh, rejecting that. I actually, I use them you know, to, to place myself in the field and in the sequence. The thing is, I think we've used uh, potassium, argon, and rubidium strontium. And, uh, but uh, the thing is that, uh, I'm regardless whether they, they can be used in the field and they have some meaning um, within the sequence, fossils tell us that uh, something is wrong with that. Fossils cannot stay on, on land or on the seafloor for hundreds of years, as radiometric dates suggest. So, either we don't understand the fossilization pro, uh, process, <coughs> or we don't understand radiometric dates, <coughs> dating and dates the right way. <coughs> and now, I, maybe we should finish with this, yeah. kind of uh. an appeal to, to be honest with with evidence and data. Do not reject things because you don't understand them or because you can't explain them within your <laughs> particular framework, being either biblical or evolutionist. Don't reject the other idea, the other ideas. <laughs> Colleagues who've come with us, um, most of them have been very open to consider the, the possibility of other, other explanations, and we've enriched one another with that. Some other colleagues come and say, I don't want to, literally, I don't want to have anything to do with you. I just go on my own because you're a danger for me and things like that uh, because your ideas are out of science. And other scientists say, oh, you work just like me. I don't have any problem. And let's talk about your ideas, by the way. Mm -hmm. So, <coughs> I encourage you to be open and at the same time be honest. There are things that, so far, we don't have an explanation for within a biblical framework. That doesn't deter me from believing the Bible. From believing that the, the, what God said <coughs> is what happened. Or what happened it was, was God said in His Word. And second, I must be honest to re to re to realize and admit that mm -hmm. I'm uh, limited, I can't explain everything, and maybe I will never. And meanwhile, I'll keep on <laughs> doing research and scratching my head. Well, yeah, uh, with reference to well, Paul was talking about this lava flow in Hawaii. Uh, one of the interesting additions you could add to that comment is that uh, they did get younger and younger dates from this lava flow as they got closer to the surface. And the lava flow is assumed to be less than 15,000 years old based on carbon-14 dating and so on, even though they got 40, 43, 44, 45 million uh, down at the bottom, which uh, suggests hydrostatic pressure trapped the excess argon, and that's why they got the sequence. And you have a, a, a sequence of older dates here due to what you'd expect during the flood. Just just an interesting though, sidelight. Even though it's the same It's the same, event. considered the same event, yes. It, it's, it's very interesting uh, paper. Uh, secondly, I uh, just want to mention uh, uh, about this skeleton of our legs and so on on whales. They have found legs on whales. These are totally the exception, but it's, it's in the literature. It's, uh, uh, and they have bones in them and so on. They're not functional. They're just hanging on the outside of the body. Uh, these whales do have genes that can do this the same way. Snakes have genes that can produce legs. I think God created an original pattern of vertebrates that had legs. And these have been suppressed, and when the suppression stops, then occasionally these things show up with these anomalies here, which is a very interesting feature. And so some of the embryonic uh, uh, dolphins and, uh, uh, well, uh, similar animals, so on, 
they do develop little bud buds in the uh, some of the literature in Germany and so on points buds of legs developing, but they they stop developing, and so. Thank you. So yeah, it, that's it, it, this is a, an yeah. interesting explanation for this. Let me show you because quick, quick because question. You raised that uh, question. Uh, this is a thin section of the sediment associated with the whales. A thin section is a is a sediment that we glue on a on a glass and we slice it. It's so thin that we can see through it under the microscope. This is this is diatom. Diatoms, diatoms are marine algae, the ones that color your swimming pool, uh, green color, and this is di the, the, most of it is diatoms. Diatoms makes um, the bulk of sediment in these areas. Hmm? Very, it's the finest sediment that you can find, hmm? and uh, it's, it's, it's algae. Is the is the the uh, skeletons, outer skeletons of. But you see these crystals here. This is crystals volcanic of volcanic ash. Hmm? Look at this crystal and, and any other. Look at this crystal, for example. The edges are sharp. You see this, these edges? They are sharp. I took these samples to an expert in Texas a few years ago and I showed him this, this, this material. And he said, he's an expert in diatoms. He said, well, th here you have rapid deposition of diatoms. Extremely rapid, something that we don't know of in modern times. Rates of deposition of diatoms nowadays, now, is between 5 to 150 centimeters per thousand years in marine basins. Well, he said, no, th you're, you have a different thing. Because otherwise, no whale would be preserved. And second, because within this diatomaceous sediment, you have, we have these volcanic crystals that are sharp. Now, if volcanic crystals came from the air, right, and descended through the water column, they're made of silica, and they dissolve really fast. And before the solution, their edges become smooth. What we found was that the edges are sharp. Means, sinking was fast and time residence on the seafloor was short. Because there's no dissolution and the edges are sharp. And that any, actually that was the subject of the paper we published with the, on the journal with the whale on the, on the cover. We published a paper saying, hey, we are questioning some assumptions based on what we find in the sediments and in, in the fossils. Nobody replied to the journal saying, these guys are wrong. Or well, they did, you know, nobody did. Um, also, we think that while these this, uh, sh um, shards of uh, volcanic uh, glass were, you know, in the atmosphere and sinking the water, you remember that whales have to come up t out of the surface to breathe. Perhaps they breathed volcanic ash and that destroyed their lungs and killed them. Uh -huh. That might be a possibility. But you see, we have evidence that question long periods of time for fossilization and buried, both from fossils and from the sediment. Now, there are other things that do suggest long time, like burrows. So we still need to Geology is this two-plate thing. You have things that suggest short time. You have things that suggest long time. Well, you work with both plates trying to, <laughs> to understand and explain it. D you know, Mary Schweitzer uh, found soft tissues in dinosaur bones. And it's, it's turning out to be fairly common, a common finding of viable soft tissue, not fossilized, not mineralized. Have you sectioned any of the larger whale bones? Well, actually, Dr. Boscovich, who was sitting next to you, is working on that. I, I supplied with uh, bones, and he had a student working on finding... Um, he, I, they, I think they... I'm not sure 
up uh, uh, to this date. I think they found protein in, in fossilized bones. And then you, could you possibly carbon-14 that? If there's enough carbon in there, you can do a carbon-14 date. So um, I was just talking with him on his way out, and he, he said he might have enough. So uh, who knows? Another year from now, we may have another presentation. Um, thank you. Can I have a copy of your presentation? <laughs> thank you for yeah. coming and have a good Sabbath. Let's pray uh, before uh, we finish. Just, just one comment about the uh, burrows. These can form quite fast mm -hmm. if animals are trapped and they're escaping. I'm not sure you've got a real problem, time problem there of burrows. You need to look at it. We, we are working on it. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, loving us, for saving us, and for providing us with um, clues about yourself, about things in the past. And even though we are limited and we don't understand uh, almost anything, what we want to do is understand you and know you better, to serve you better, to love you better. And uh, throughout this coming week, we want, to, we want to serve you and encourage others to believe that you are our Savior, regardless how much we can understand or explain. And as we leave this place, please be with each of our families. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.